When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain and began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, the salt of the earth, you are the light of the world. I came to fulfill and be reconciled to your brother. Do not last in your heart, turn the other cheek. Do not let your left hand know where your right hand is doing. Do you have pleasure in him? Do not worry about him. Do not, lest she be just, and it will be given to others. As we are all the sheep, now is the gate to life. When Jesus finished saying these things, the crowds were astonished, for he spoke with authority. This flipped everything that they had known on his head. Today's message is fortunate. All right, 14 weeks on the Sermon on the Mount. If you haven't read it, go ahead and start reading it this week. Read it every week. It's uh, three chapters. We're going to go through the three chapters in uh, Matthew, chapter 5, 6, and 7. So just read it. Get uh, it, Soak yourself in it. Get familiar with it. And we're going to go through every word that Jesus spoke. Uh, but before we jump into the message this morning, uh, first of all, I want to I want to echo what Carly said. Didn't uh, Suzanne Salino do an amazing job last Sunday? Just let her know you appreciate her. Um, you know, it, it takes a certain um, determination to stand in front of a group of people and share your heart. And so it's not easy. Uh, I, if I make it look easy, it's just because <laughs> I'm just nuts. But, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's difficult. It's one of the greatest fears that most people have is public speaking. It's actually a greater fear than death. So, uh, so we appreciate her and what she shared, deposited it into the lives of uh, those that heard it last week and those that will hear it in the weeks to come listening online. The other thing I want to mention is I'm very excited. If you've been with us for at any period of time, you know that things are constantly changing, growing, moving. Uh, I, I believe that anything that's alive is growing, and that means we have to adapt and change. And in the eight years that I've been here as the pastor, we have made a lot of uh, technological changes. Uh, you, you may like some of them, you may not. That's not really the issue. The issue is we're making these changes because the way that we engage the culture is so important. It doesn't compromise the message. It does have a realization that our culture is primarily online. You may be one of those who say, I don't even know what online is. Let not your heart be troubled, neither be afraid. Just show up on Sunday, you'll be fine. You don't need to know all this stuff. But for the vast majority of people, our culture engages through technology. And so uh, for the last eight years, Doug Kaufman has done a... Uh, an incredible job. I, I can't say it enough. He's actually down in uh, our broadcast booth right now. Uh, he has moved us so far forward in a lot of what we do technology-wise. And really, that is the front door of the church. People check us out online, uh, watch our online services before they may ever step foot uh, here live on a Sunday morning. Indeed, there are people who will never be here live on a Sunday morning because they're watching from places like Florida and California and New York, and so welcome all of you that are joining us. And, uh, but over eight years of working with Doug, he has moved the needle so far that he has worked himself out of a job because what is needed now is a full-time job. He already like, has one of those. And so uh, through a lot of prayer and, and uh, just looking at our finances and looking at the vision and where are we going in the future of the church, we have decided to bring out a full-time tech director, and we are excited, uh, a young man by the name of David Candler. Uh, if you don't know who David Candler is, you may know him as the wife of Marla Candler. Now you say, I don't know who Marla Candler is. She used to be Marla Kaufman. And, and now you go, oh, okay, she's, that, that's the connection. But uh, they are coming in July, and uh, we're excited. He'll be here, I think, moving up on July 9th. And so uh, when you get to meet him, welcome him. He, he's a Southerner. So make some sweet tea. He'll be happy. <laughs> Give him a bowl of grits. Um, but, uh, but in all seriousness, we are looking for a, a place for him, them to store their uh, their. Household. They're going to be living with uh, their, his in-laws, with Marla's parents for a little while. So if anyone knows of a place that they could store their goods, please let me know after service and we'll get you in contact with them. But uh, please be praying as they move. It's a big move. Uh, he's always lived in that, or primarily lived in that area. Marla can't wait to come back to God's country. And, um, 
So we are excited and fortunate to have them. But again, Doug downstairs, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. You are awesome. Well, the Sermon on the Mount, we're going to talk about fortunate. Now, uh, Carly said she's grown up in church, but she doesn't really know what the Sermon on the Mount is. You may, a lot of you may feel like that. One thing that I've learned in life is that um, there are sayings, phrases that often stick out to us. Just in the last century alone, there are some famous speeches that have been given. And, and there are lines, there are uh, quotes from those that we remember that stirred our hearts when we heard them then, if some of us were around, and they still stir our hearts today. Quotes like this from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Oh, I can't wait for that day. Or this quote by Franklin D. Roosevelt. This was in his first inauguration in the depth of the uh, Great Depression. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Now, when you hear these quotes, how many of you can hear the voice of the person speaking it? Yeah, that's how well-known these quotes are. Here's another one from JFK. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. Where has that gone? Um, the next one by Ronald Reagan. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And then... Uh, the, the former prime minister of the UK, Winston Churchill, said, We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. Those words stirred the hearts of people when they heard them, and they indeed still stir our hearts today. But there is one sermon that's ever been given, one speech, one a dialogue, really a monologue that's ever been had that has more, um, been more poignant, more moving, more challenging than any other. It's the Sermon on the Mount given by Jesus who lived the most amazing life ever lived. He, the, the, the phrases, the terms, just in this short little sermon that he gave, we know so well. You may not know they're from the Sermon on the Mount. Judge not lest you be judged. Turn the other cheek. You are the light of the world. And so many others all found in the Sermon on the Mount. The most famous prayer ever uttered. Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Who's ever heard that one? Sermon on the Mount. It is filled with so much. And yet we can sometimes, even though it challenges us today, it inspires us today, we can miss out on the deep truths that Jesus was communicating. Because this sermon is the heart of his revolutionary message. And make no mistake about it, Jesus' message and his life was revolutionary to the core. It's just not the type of revolution that we think. So we're going to dive in today, and we're going to look, starting today, in the next 14 weeks, at every word he spoke in the Sermon on the Mount. So we're going to start with what's known as the Beatitudes. Now, these are a series of statements. They all begin with the word blessed. Now, have, has anyone ever wondered how in the world do we get Beatitudes from blessed? Okay. Let me, let me just explain this to you. Uh, at one point in history, the Bible was only translated in Latin. From Greek and Hebrew, it was in Latin the Latin Vulgate. In Latin, the word blessed is the word beati. And so when there's more than one, it's the beatis, the beatitudes. And so that's where we get that from. It's just a fine Latin word, but Latin's not really a language most of us speak. So it was translated to blessed in English. But in the Greek, in the original language, Jesus would have spoken in Aramaic, but in the original Greek, that word blessed means those who are happy, those who are to be congratulated, those who are fortunate, the truly fortunate. So Jesus starts with this series of statements, and he says, a truly fortunate life looks like this. And what he says is unlike anything anyone had ever heard. So here's this first statement, Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. Blessed, 
Fortunate are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus starts by saying something that makes no sense to us. You're fortunate when you're poor. It doesn't matter what you're poor in. We never uh, uh, connect being fortunate with being poor. Being poor in anything. I mean, if you're poor, you're not fortunate. But Jesus says, no, indeed, if you are poor in spirit, you are among the most fortunate people that ever lived. And then he goes on and explains why. Now, what does it mean to be poor in spirit? Poor in spirit means that you are aware of the emptiness, the the, the fact that you're bankrupt spiritually, that your way of trying to connect with God, to appease God, to live a life that's pleasing to God, your path to aspire to spirituality doesn't work. And once you realize that, you are so very fortunate. So being poor in spirit is to admit that you are spiritually empty. So Jesus says, when you get in touch with that reality, that you're spiritually empty, then and only then does the kingdom of God open up to you. When you realize you can't get to God on your own, your own way doesn't work. Listen, people tried for thousands of years before Jesus showed up, and people have tried for thousands of years after to figure out how to ascend the mountain and get into God's good graces. And if we've learned nothing else, it's that we can't. The only way in which we can connect with God is not by our own effort, not by trying to please God, not by trying to earn our way into, but by falling on our knees and crying out for grace. So, so Jesus is saying when you realize it doesn't work, then you are the most fortunate person of all. And this speaks to the whole idea of meaning, of purpose, of of, of existence. Why do I exist? What's my purpose in life? It's not just to do stuff. It's not just to, to acquire stuff. It's not just to accumulate stuff. It's not just to be busy and, and, and to eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow I shall die. The whole issue is my life means nothing unless I can identify with my spiritual emptiness. And therefore, I can connect with the living God who then pours meaning and purpose and value into my life. And I, my life is now connected to an eternal kingdom. See, when you don't have that, then your life is temporal. Our life on earth is temporal, but everything you do is temporal. So here's something that's so important, and you have to remember that everything that matters most to you means nothing if it ends with you. And for so many of us, if we can't admit our spiritual emptiness, our brokenness, our bankruptcy, our poorness, we'll never accomplish anything. Listen, I have great things in my life, amazing things in my life. I am, I am so uh, thankful. I, I am married to the most incredible woman you have ever met. And for 27 years, she has stood by me. And I have taken her from one side of the country to the other and everywhere in between. And we have an amazing marriage. We have four incredible kids who are are a delight. They are uh, two teenagers, two in their 20s. and, And I love them with all my heart. We have an absolutely perfect, and I mean perfect, grandson. I know some of you think, some of you think you do, you don't. I do. No, we, we, have, we have an amazing grandson. We're fortunate. We have, a, we have deep, meaningful relationships with Jamie's parents, my wife Jamie, with her parents, with my mom, with my dad. As a matter of fact, my parents are watching right now. Uh, and so it, it, love having you. Actually, my mom is not watching right now. She had something else to do. Um, <laughs> but she'll watch later. Um, we have, we have deep, meaningful relationships with our parents. I get to serve in this incredible church to fulfill a calling that God's put on my life, and I couldn't be more thankful for that. I've had the opportunity to travel around the world and, and minister and, and see things and, and interact with people of different cultures and backgrounds. All of those things. I'm blessed financially. I'm, I'm in good health. All those things don't mean anything compared to my relationship with God. Because if I don't have that deep, meaningful, abiding relationship with God, it all ends with me. What a sad reality that would be. But instead, when you admit, 
when I admit, when I come to grips with the fact that I am spiritually poor, the kingdom of God opens to me, and I can invest in something that's eternal, that's everlasting, that doesn't end with me, but that lives far, far beyond me, indeed, into all eternity. So Jesus is saying, you are so very fortunate. You are among the most fortunate people of all when you come to the realization that you are spiritually bankrupt. Because then, and only then, does the kingdom of God open up to you. Now, here's the sad part. For many of you, for many Christians, I should say, for many Christians, they come to the point of saying, I'm spiritually bankrupt. I need God. The kingdom of heaven opens up to them. And then they say, now I'm spiritually rich. I don't need God. Jesus is also saying, your spiritual bankruptcy has to be a reality. You didn't get into a relationship with God on your own, and you don't now grow past your need for a relationship with God. Rest on his word. Stay anchored to his word. Build everything around his word. If you think you can somehow spiritually evolve past your need for God, you're no longer spiritually poor. Now you think you're spiritually rich. And the kingdom of God will not be open to you. So that's what he starts with. Then his next statement is this. Blessed are those who mourn. For they will be comforted. Now again, this makes no sense. You're fortunate when you're sorrowful. You're fortunate when you're mourning. Uh, it's good. Listen, if you've ever mourned, let's just talk about uh, the loss of a loved one. If you've ever mourned the loss of a loved one, that doesn't feel fortunate. That doesn't feel good. That doesn't feel blessed. And listen, I just have some advice for you. If you meet someone, you have a conversation with someone, and they've lost a loved one, a friend, family member. Don't go up to them and say, no, the Bible says you're fortunate. You're blessed. Yeah, they're probably going to want to slap you. And, and the pastor may encourage that. Um, no, <laughs> no the, it, it, Jesus isn't talking about you're fortunate because of what you're feeling. He's not saying the feeling of loss, of mourning, of sorrow. You're mourning uh, the death, the loss of a business, the end of a marriage, the, the, the breaking up of a, of a situation. He's not saying that's fortunate. He's saying you're fortunate because in that, if you will have eyes to see and a heart to receive, Jesus himself will bring you comfort. You can find comfort through God's Holy Spirit in those moments of pain and sorrow. This is what it says in the book of Revelation. He, Jesus himself, will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. You're fortunate when you mourn because Jesus says, I'll come in and I'll bring comfort into that situation. Moreover, Jesus isn't just talking about those situations in life that cause us sorrow and pain and cause us to mourn at, a, at, at, a, at that level. He's talking about something deeper. He's saying you are fortunate when you mourn and you're sorrowful over your sins. When you realize that you have lived a way that is counter to what God asks of you and you are repentant, you're mournful, you're sorrowful, You'll be comforted. Grace will come in. Forgiveness will flow. This is when you're not a Christian and you come to a point of repentance. And this is as those of us who walk out our Christian journey and we stumble and fall and make mistakes and sin and wound people and say stupid things and act in stupid ways and, and are selfish and, and miserly and not generous and all these things and we gossip and slander and do all kind of stuff. And then we say, what was I thinking? When we're mournful, when we're sorrowful, when we regret what we've done and we come to God and ask forgiveness, you're so fortunate because you will be comforted. Grace will flow. Now, David, King David, the great king of Israel, the David who killed Goliath, that same David who wrote most of the Psalms wrote this. Now, tell me if this doesn't identify with, with our hearts about being mournful over sin. That's what he says in Psalm 32. 
Blessed, there's that same word. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away. Then I acknowledged my sin. Then I was fortunate. I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquities. But I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. And then what's the result? The righteous in the Lord can rejoice and be glad. They can sing with an upright heart. I heard a quote from a psychologist. He said he could dismiss about 90% of his patients if he could simply help them overcome the feelings of guilt. If they could feel forgiven. He was so close to being right. He was so close to being right. It's not about feeling forgiven. It's about being forgiven. I I hear people, I don't feel forgiven. (laughs) I got news for you. Forgiveness doesn't feel like anything. It, it's, not a, 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 it's not something you feel. It's a reality that God says you are forgiven. Be free. When we, can, when we can mourn and be sorrowful over the sin in our life, you are the most fortunate of all. Because grace, forgiveness will flow, and you will be comforted. Your bones don't have to waste away, as David said. Then Jesus goes on and says this, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Most of us think of the word meek as weak, the weak, the pushovers, the cowardly. We don't want to be identified as meek. But meek doesn't mean those things at all. When Jesus spoke the word meek, he's communicating two primary words, strength and power. Meek is restrained strength. It's power under control. So Jesus, think about an MMA fighter. Or a boxer, right? Here's this MMA fighter, and and they're out somewhere, and some bloke decides, I want to pick a fight. Now, this this fighter could mop the floor with this fella. I mean, no problem. But instead, they turn and walk away. That's the picture of meekness. I have the power. I have the ability. I have the strength. But I choose not to exert it. That's not how we live. We live about taking advantage of what I have, pressing my advantage, using everything at my disposal. Meekness isn't something that we we like. We like power. We want strength. But meekness speaks to security. I know who I am. I know I could mop the floor with this person. I'm not going to. So here's one thing that you can uh, remember is this. When you are truly meek, you are actually more secure. You're more secure. If you've ever, I'm not, I'm not telling you to say this. I'm just saying, make a mental note. If you're, if you're ever in a business meeting and the boss has to keep reminding you he's the boss, that's a person who's not meek. It's a person who's insecure. The, everyone knows the boss is the boss. You didn't, like, forget. I'm not saying there's never a moment where things get out of control, a decision has to be made, and someone has to say, now listen, it seems right to the Holy Spirit and to me, and this is the decision. The the buck stops with me. There, There are moments you have to say that. I'm not saying it's always wrong. I'm saying when someone is constantly saying, I am in charge, I'm the boss, I'm the... Okay, relax, we all know that. But we always have to press, we have to talk about this. Meekness is a whole idea. See, what we want in our world, in our life, is that we think it's all about accumulating stuff. Meekness says, I don't need to accumulate more. I don't need to accumulate better. I don't need to to get more stuff. Meekness says, I can be content with where I am and with what I have. I have the power to get more. I have the power to accumulate more. I have the power to run over people and to press my advantage, but I'm not going going to do that. I am going to learn to be content. I'm going to learn to be secure. A sign of meekness is somebody who isn't constantly trying to, to just gather more and more to themselves to make a name for themselves. Look, look at all this that I've accomplished. 
Meekness makes life more, uh, less about acquiring and more about contentment. When you're meek, you say, I'm content. Now, here's the amazing thing. Jesus says when you're meek and you learn contentment, it's not about acquiring. Here's the amazing thing. If you're meek and you have the power to acquire everything but you choose not to, you know what you inherit? The earth. If you learn to walk in meekness, you actually get the very thing that you're choosing not to strive for. But we don't get it now. We get it later. We want the immediate payoff. So meekness. Meekness is that whole idea of just saying, I'm not, I'm not pressing for this. Then Jesus goes on and says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Hunger and thirst, the whole idea is to crave for something, to desire something. And what is it that Jesus says you're fortunate with, that you crave and desire? So it's funny, right before this, Jesus says, don't strive for stuff, strive for this. Instead, crave, earnestly desire righteousness. Righteousness simply means right living with God. Living right with God. Living the way God asks you to live. Blessed are those who internally have this drive and desire to live a life that pleases God. Because when you do, you will be filled. Now, what we often do is we mistake righteousness as all outward actions. And so I'm righteous because I don't smoke and chew or hang with the girls that do. That does not make one righteous. It might make one smart, but it doesn't make one righteous. Righteousness is an inward reality that then manifests itself outwardly. Righteousness, inward righteousness, guides your actions and informs your decisions. But it starts inwardly. Philippians 2.13 says, For it is God who is at work in you to both do outwardly and will make decisions for his good pleasure. That is what righteousness is. It is an internal reality that manifests itself outwardly. Don't, don't think I'm righteous because I don't watch certain movies. That doesn't make you righteous. You're righteous because the voice of the Holy Spirit inside of you is saying, don't watch that movie. And then you obey the voice of the Holy Spirit. Not watching the movie is not what made you righteous. The voice of the Holy Spirit inside of you, informing you, leading you, guiding you, and then you walking that out is righteousness. It's not just having a list. I did everything on a the list, therefore I'm righteous. So you have to constantly be praying, God, speak to me, lead me, Guide me by your word. Lead me by your Holy Spirit. When I hear your voice warning me, oh God, help me to, to, to move in that direction. And what happens? Then you will be filled. Have you ever met someone and it just seems like everything they do just oozes positivity? They just naturally encourage each other. They're, they're, uh, they affirm people. They build them up. They, 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 they're just a joy to be around. Have you ever met someone like that? Okay, if you have, what you're looking at is someone who has hungered and thirsted for righteousness and who's been filled. Because in John, uh, I think it's John 7, 32, it's Jesus says, out of their bellies, out of their hearts will flow rivers of life, rivers of living water. They have been filled. They've been filled so much with righteousness, with right living, that it simply pours out of them. So when you hunger and thirst for righteousness, what you're saying is, God, I want you to come into my life and transform me inwardly and then come outside of me to impact the world around me. That, when you hunger and thirst for righteousness, to live right with God like that, you will be filled, and your life will then impact so many others. That's what God wants for us. Then he goes on and says, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Now, merciful is, um, we think mercy is what we show to the down and out, the least and the lost, the, 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 the dregs of society. I'll be merciful to the homeless person. I'm not saying we shouldn't be. But being merciful is showing grace and forgiveness, compassion, patience, tenderness, kindness. 
all the fruit of the Spirit to everyone who needs it. And you know who needs it? Everyone. So being merciful is saying, I am going to take what's inside of me, and I am going to make sure that the way I treat people is a way that honors God. I'm going to be merciful to everyone. I'm going to show mercy. I'm going to... When you show mercy, what you're doing is you're laying aside your rights. Okay? If someone has violated you, damaged you, sinned against you in some way, you have every right to hold that. Mercy says, I'm laying my rights down. I have the right. I'm choosing not to exercise it. Mercy means not taking advantage for your own advantage. I'm going to make them pay. I'm going to make them suffer. We don't live like that. Mercy is not an attribute that we like. We don't want anyone to get ahead of us. We want the promotion. We want the pay raise. We don't want people to get ahead of us on the highway. Right? Who's ever been driving? And I'm not talking about the... the Divided highways. I'm talking about a two-lane road, and and it's got the, it's got the dotted yellow line, and you're going, and all of a sudden you see that person in that sports car, and they're pedal to the metal, going as fast as they can, and you say, "Not today. I'm revving up my Hyundai." <laughs> all right, we don't want them to pass us. Okay, that's just me. Um, <laughs> we we don't want people to get ahead of us in anything. We want to press the advantage for our own sake. And Jesus says, blessed are you when you're merciful in every endeavor. So many, what we've made an art form in our country is saying, I'm going to leverage everything to my advantage. And if that's not enough, you know what I'll do? I'll at least make sure I take somebody down with me. If I can't get the promotion, I'm sure a sec going to make sure that she doesn't because she doesn't deserve it. I don't care if he gets it, but she knew. Uh, if, I, if I can't get her to be my wife, she rejects me. I'm going to make sure he doesn't get her. He doesn't deserve her. I remember growing up, we would play board games. And, and the board games when I were growing up were, the word board was appropriate. <laughs> but we, we'd go, and, and every once in a while, we'd go to my cousin's house, and we'd all, let's play a, a game. And everyone wanted to win. But very often, my older brother, we would maybe be halfway through the game, and it would be apparent he wasn't going to win. He would, he would, you know, in a moment of quiet, he would look, and he would fix his gaze on someone. And he'd say, it's clear I'm not going to win. My goal isn't to win. My goal is to make sure you don't. I mean, and he would. I mean, he would just, he would just go against that person. But so many of us live like that. We, want to, we don't want to be merciful. You get politicians, they don't care about winning the election. They care about making sure that person doesn't win the election. But Jesus says, blessed are you when you're merciful. When you learn to say, I have a right, I have an advantage, I can press it for my own, but I'm going to step back. It's not just about what I can get, what I can do, what I have the right for. I'm going to be merciful. What's amazing, Jesus says, you're so fortunate because then when you need mercy, and you will, you will need mercy. And when you need mercy, mercy will come to you. Mercy flows most freely to those who give it most freely. You want to receive mercy from God? Be merciful to others. You want to receive mercy from your spouse, from your children, from your boss, from your employees? Be merciful to your spouse, to your children, to your boss, to your employees. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. You're so fortunate when you learn to live in this dynamic. Instead of pressing your advantage. Be merciful. And then Jesus goes on and says this, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. When Jesus uses the word heart, he's not meaning the physical hearts in our bodies. What he's meaning, that word speaks to the, the, the essence of who we are, the core of who we are, the, the part of us that informs our decisions, the part of us that sets the course for our lives. 
It's, it's the true idea of who we are. So what Jesus is saying is when you are pure in heart, when you are singularly devoted, fixed on one thing, and that thing is God, you will see God. Pure in heart means that the core of your being is completely centered on the Lord. Now, this is not easy. I'm telling you. It, it feels like you'll get there and then you'll lose focus. You'll get there and then you get off. You get, that is learning to walk out your salvation with fear and trembling. So don't be discouraged that you feel like in one moment you're completely there, focused, centered, everything's God-centric. And then the next moment, you're all over the place. Just come back. Come back. Keep saying, God, help me be focused on you. Help me be focused on you. Help me be focused on you. The whole idea Jesus is, is getting at is that in our lives, we tend to live splintered lives, compartmentalized lives, right? We've got our spiritual life. We've got our family life. We've got our business life. We've got our recreational life. And then we've got the part of our life that nobody knows. It's all the stuff that we do think in the darkness where nobody sees. And we think we can keep them all segregated. And maybe we can here on earth. But God knows all, sees all, and is in all, and he is not fooled by any of it. And so when we come to that reality and say, okay, all of my life I want to be fixed on Jesus. How I am at work, how I am at home, how I am with my kids when I'm out playing uh, sports, when I'm walking through the community, when I'm shopping, when I'm driving, when nobody's around and I'm looking on my phone. I want everything to be centered on the Lord. I don't want to be splintered. Jesus says you're so fortunate when you're not pulled in a thousand different directions by a thousand different voices. You are so fortunate. Why? Because you will see God. You'll start to see God in everything. I hear people say all the time, we don't see God today. It's because we're not centered and focused and looking for God. You can see God in your marriage. You can see God in your finances. You can see God in your uh, neighborhood. You can see God at work. You can see God everywhere if you'll have the eyes to see him. And the only way you do that is when you focus on him, when your life is centered on him, when you're pure in heart, undivided. And it's not easy, but I'm telling you, you will start to see God in so many incredible ways in different places. You'll see him You'll see him and it will blow you away. Then Jesus goes on and says this, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Peacemaker does not mean conflict avoider. Let me say that again. Peacemaker does not mean conflict avoider. Indeed, avoiding conflict often makes it worse, not better. Peacemaker means actively pursuing peace. So let me, let me give you an example, okay? I think we all would agree with this. In our world today, in America, we, we desperately need racial reconciliation. Now, how do we do that? It's not just philosophically acquiescing to that truth. Yes, we need this. It's saying, how do I actively pursue this? And listen to me. That doesn't mean going to a march. It doesn't mean necessarily holding a, a, a placard somewhere. Actively pursuing racial reconciliation means saying, how do I respond to racial diversity in my church? How do I respond to racial diversity in my neighborhood? How would I respond to racial diversity if one of my children showed up with someone of a different persuasion? How, how, how do I respond to that? And am I actively pursuing relationships with people who look different than me, have different backgrounds than me, have different skin tones in me, so that I can have deep, meaningful conversations. And those conversations are going to challenge me. They're going to make me grow. They're going to be transformative. I'm going to hear some things I never heard. I'm going to uh, consider some things I never considered, and I'm going to understand some things I never understood. But if I'm going to be a peacemaker, I'm going to actively pursue peace, which means in doing that, and here's the key, in doing that, stop getting defensive. My Lord, we get defensive on social media. We get defensive in conversations. How can you say that this? How can you? Just listen. You're not a peacemaker if you're getting defensive. You know, defensive, that word is a military term. I'm a peacemaker. I'm defensive. No. What you have to do is say, I'm not going to be defensive. 
I'm going to actively pursue peace. I'm going to consider some things I never considered before. I want to understand where that person's coming from so that we can have peace. We can have racial reconciliation. See, your, your attitude, your actions reflect your origins. And what is God? God is the ultimate peacemaker. God, through Jesus Christ, came to bring peace, right? We were, we were en- enemies with God, the Bible says. But God sent his son Jesus so that we can now be in relationship with him. When we actively pursue peace, when we're peacemakers, we'll be called the sons of God, the daughters of God, the children of God, because when we actively pursue peace, you know who we're being like? Our Heavenly Father. Our actions reflect our origin. When you work to bring peace, you reflect the heart of of your heavenly father. People ought to see you acting like God, bringing peace where there's hostility, making an effort. People will call you a child of God. They're they're acting like God. And even if people don't, God himself will call you his child. They're like me. Isn't that the greatest praise we can receive? And then Jesus ends with this. Because you know, he says all that you're so fortunate when you do all these things. And then Jesus says, now, just to make sure you really appreciate this. You're really fortunate when you're persecuted because of righteousness. For yours is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely imprison you and say all kind of evil against you. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So Jesus is under no illusion. He understands that what he's asking us to do is not what we want to do. He's not telling people what they want to hear. He's telling people what they need to hear. He's not telling you what you want to hear. He's telling you what you need to hear because his whole point is that if you're going to live a fortunate life, you have to understand it's going to come with some struggle. A truly fortunate life is not an easy life. A truly fortunate life, a blessed life, is not an easy life. We want the easy life, but Jesus says this isn't going to be an easy life. It's going to be difficult. It's going to have some hardships. You're going to have to endure some things, right? Didn't Jesus live the most amazing, remarkable life of anyone? He was called the man of sorrow, acquainted with griefs, and was nailed on a cross. And we say, I want to be a follower of Jesus. I want it easy. Jesus says, no, no, no. A fortunate life is not an easy life. But a fortunate life is an amazing, it's an amazing life. It's an impactful life. It's a life that's transformative for yourself, for your family, for the world in which you live in. Jesus says, I want you to live the most fortunate life possible. But we want the easy. We want the comfortable. So I just want to say it like this. Jesus taught about living a meaningful life, not a comfortable life. If you want to experience the most meaningful, fortunate life possible, it's not for those who are looking for the easy, the comfortable, and the convenient. It's for those who will say, I will stand for my beliefs, and I will not compromise, even if it kills me. I will not back down, even if you want to blackball me, persecute me, blacklist me, you want to uh, cast me off, you want to mock me, anything like that. Even if you want to take my life, I'm willing to die because I know the kingdom I'm a part of. I know the king who loves me, who laid his life down for me, and I will stand for him no matter what. Jesus says, if you want to live a truly meaningful, fortunate, remarkable life, it turns everything upside down. You lay your life down so it'll be raised up again. You sacrifice so that you'll be blessed. You humble yourself so that God will honor you. Jesus says the whole thing's topside down. That's what the Sermon on the Mount is all about. And Jesus starts right here. Here are the Beatitudes. They're not a checklist of things to do. They're a series of choices that we make. But when we make these choices, it opens up to us the most fortunate, meaningful, impactful life we could ever live. The choice is, do you want to live it? This is where Jesus starts the Sermon on the Mount, and it just gets better from here. Next week, we're going to talk about being a person of influence. What does that mean? How do you have an influential life? 
But it starts, Jesus starts with these statements because make no mistake about it. He says, you have a choice to make. You can choose to pursue the most fortunate, meaningful, impactful, blessed life. Or you can live for self. But there is no middle ground. So I'm going to ask if you'd stand to your feet. Just begin to pray and ask yourself, what kind of life do I want to live? Do I want to live a meaningful life, a fortunate life? Just ask yourself. Not just in light of, do I want to be fortunate and have a bunch of stuff and possessions and go a bunch of places? Do I want to live the type of fortunate life that we just learned about, that Jesus spoke about? Do I want that? Just close your eyes and begin to ask. Ask God. Now, before, before I pray for you, and I'm going, I'm going to in just a moment, but before I do, you can't live that type of fortunate life until you accept the life of Christ into your own, until you fall to your knees, cry out, God, forgive me. I have messed up. I have sinned. I have made mistakes. I have hurt people. I have wounded people. I've hurt myself. I've wounded myself. And God, I've done nothing that can earn my way into your good graces. And I've tried. But I've realized I need grace. I need mercy. I need forgiveness. You can't live a fortunate life. You can't live a meaningful life. You can't live an impactful life. You can't live that blessed life until you surrender your life to Jesus Christ. So if that's you here this morning, if you're joining us online and you say, I want to give my life to Christ. If you're online, just click the button that says, I'm surrendering my life. If you're here this morning, I'm going to ask right where you are, just raise your hand. Just raise your hand and say, I want to give my life to Jesus. Maybe you did this when you were a kid growing up, but it's been years, decades. And you say, I don't really even know what I meant when I rose my hand all those years ago. This is a day. This is a new day. Old things have passed. All things are made new. If you didn't know what you prayed back then, I'm not saying you didn't mean it at that level, but now you understand deeper, more fully what it means to surrender. So if you want to lay your life down and receive new life in Christ, just raise your hand. And now I want to lead us in a simple little prayer, and I'm going to ask whether you've raised your hand or not, if you would say these words after me. But if you're saying these words for the first time, or maybe you're rededicating your life and you mean them, it's not just saying the words, but you mean them in your heart. You're going to enter a new relationship and a new dynamic with the Lord that you've never had before. So let's just pray these words together. Heavenly Father, I come to you now and I ask you to forgive me. Forgive me for my sins. I lay down my life and I, really, I receive new life in Christ. Help me to live for you, to share your love with others, to live a fortunate life, an impactful life, a meaningful life, so that at the end of my life, I will hear you say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Until then, lead me by your spirit. Fill me with your spirit. Give me fruit of the Spirit. Allow me to exercise the gifts of the Spirit and be faithful to you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. If you prayed that prayer, welcome to God's family. If you're online, click the Let Us Know button. We want to follow up with you and help you take your next steps in following Christ. If you prayed that prayer here this morning, when we dismiss, please come forward. Let someone talk to you and encourage you and help you on this journey. But now, you've been praying, God, do I want to live that meaningful life, that fortunate life? If that's you, right where you are, if you say, I want to live in light of all that we just learned, I want Jesus to bring his spirit to bear in my life. It's righteousness, mercy, peace, all those things. I want to live that kind of life. If that's you, right where you are, just raise your hand. Don't be timid. Be bold. Say, I want to live like that. I want to live a meaningful life, a fortunate life. I want to embrace it. God, I pray for every hand that's raised, those that have the, the tenacity to say, God, I want to live this kind of life. Not comfortable, not easy. God, I want to live right on the edge. No matter what it costs me, if it costs me everything, 
If it costs me my reputation, if it costs me a relationship, if it costs me a friendship, God, I want to live for you. I want to stand for you, and I'm willing to die for you because if they take everything, I still get everything. I inherit an eternal kingdom, a kingdom without end, whose king loves me, whose king died for me. God, I, I get the best of it. No matter what I have to endure here on earth, God, help me to live a meaningful, fortunate life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen, amen, amen. Now we're going to end with just one last song. So uh, Chad's going to lead us in that. Let's sing this as worship to God together.